I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. that you give us that opportunity that we can give ourselves away to you, Lord. 
If you can use anything, Lord Jesus, you can use me. No matter what I have or no matter what I don't have, you just want an open, broken heart that you will not despise, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being the king of my heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are my savior. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where Thank you, 
you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, Lord, for being a man of your word. Because you are good and nothing changes you. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your truth. We can count on you, Lord. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. All things, all things are possible. When we believe, all chains are breakable. When we receive Yahweh, you keep your promises. If you say, You said 
all of you here tonight. It's very refreshing to see all of you tonight. The rain is not stopping us from worshiping our Lord. Amen. Uh, so we're continuing in our journey through the gospel of John, and we've been able to unpack how John has revealed Jesus's divine nature and his lineage and the lineage of Jesus. Uh, we've been able to see how Christ is presented to the world through the testimony of John, John the Baptist. We can see how Christ is viewed by the world through the wedding, the wedding guest at the wedding of Canaan, by the Jews when, the, when Jesus cleared out the temple, by John's disciples when John exalts Jesus, by the Samaritans when Jesus told the Samaritan woman everything that she had ever done, and by the, by the Galileans when Jesus heals the official son. And in John chapters 5 through 12, we begin to see how Christ is being rejected by the world. And we see like the struggle with unbelief and this wrestling with Christ's true identity. And as we continue on through the book of John in John chapter 5, we see that Jesus shows his power and authority as he tells the lame man to get up and walk to pick up his mac and walk. He goes on to explain that he is the son of God and he begins to reveal his intimate relationship with God the Father. Then we continue on in Jesus in John chapter six, which Patrick preached on this Sunday. Uh, he begins to multiply bread and fish, <laughs> which seems like, well, it is a miracle. <laughs> and he feeds over 5,000 people and instead of believing, that Jesus is who he says he is, people begin to just seek him for his miracles. And to quote Pastor Josue from this Sunday, and Pastor Josue, I did understand a little bit when you preached that for the Spanish service on Sunday, and you said something really good, and actually Evelyn texted me and translated it for me, and I, I got it, I, I knew it. <laughs> um, but he said many uh, began following Christ for his benefits, and I thought that was super good. And so tonight... We will begin to unpack not only Jesus being a miracle-working God, because he is our miracle-working God, but also that he's a God of signs and wonders. So we're going to open up to John chapter 6, starting at verse 15, and I'll be reading from the Living Translation. And if you are physically able to, if we can stand for the reading of the word. When you have it, say amen. Okay, so we are uh, John chapter 5, beginning at verse 15, and it reads, I'm sorry, John, John chapter 6. Gilbert, you were listening. You were listening. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John chapter 6, beginning at verse 15, and it reads, When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. That evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as the darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Soon, a gale swept down upon them and the sea grew very rough. They had rowed three or four miles when suddenly... They saw Jesus walking on the water toward them, toward the boat. They were terrified, but he called out to them, don't be afraid, I am here. Then they were, they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the, the only boat, and they realized Jesus had not gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed them, had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. 
So when he saw the crowd that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, sorry, I don't know why. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boat and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get there? Get here. You may all be seated. <laughs> So to set the scene, which I was very excited about, this literally happens right after Jesus feeds the 5,000, which is right after Sunday's preaching for those of you who were here. Um, But to set the tone uh, and give some context, right before this, Jesus and his disciples had just crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, which was also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd had kept following him wherever he went, because he was performing all these signs, miraculous signs, and he was healing the sick. And so Jesus wanted to feed the crowd, and so he miraculously took five loaves and two fish, and he fed over 5,000 people. I still can't believe that. (laughs) Talk about multiplying. And not only did he feed them, everyone was left full. And when people witnessed this, they believed that Jesus was the prophet that they had been expecting. So here we are, landing at verse 15 of John chapter 6, and it reads, When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. The people had planned to make Jesus their king, and this was the only gospel that had mentioned this, because this same story is mentioned in both Matthew and Mark which made this very exciting to study because I gathered all the Gospels and was putting all the pieces together, so that was really exciting. (laughs) Um, So the crowd's main purpose was to to secure, through Jesus, a constant supply for free food rather than identifying Jesus' messianic potential. Jesus departed to a mountain alone, and he had planned to do this before he had fed the 5,000, but people continued to follow him. The crowds kept uh, continued to follow him. And in Mark chapter 6, verse 30, it says that the apostles had returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. John the Baptist had just been beheaded, and the disciples had heard about it, and they went to go give him a proper burial. And so uh, Jesus then goes on in Mark chapter 6, verse 31. He tells his disciples, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. But so many people had begun to gather that the, Jesus and the disciples didn't even have time to eat. There, were, there was just this huge crowd that was following them. So after sending people home, after feeding the 5,000, Jesus departed to a mountain alone to pray. And then it became nighttime, and he remained there, and he stood alone. Verse, 9, verse 16, that evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore and waited for him. After feeding the 5,000, Jesus told his disciples to go back into the boat and head to Bethsaida while he was continuing to uh, send people home after feeding the 5,000. Jesus didn't tell his disciples to wait for him, and yet they did. He told them to get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he continued to finish up. What's not mentioned here, but what's mentioned in the two other Gospels, is that Jesus urges them to get into the boat. Sometimes when God tells us to do something, we're hesitant in our, our, our obedience. We want to think about how we're going to get there. I don't have enough money. Uh, what are people going to think? Jesus is not with me. God is not a God of confusion, and when he gives you instructions or he gives you uh, orders, commands, I would say, uh, you don't need another confirmation or another sign for, to do what he needs you to do. <laughs> And yet, we're like, Lord, give me another sign. I need more confirmation. (laughs) But in this case, the disciples wanted Jesus on the boat with them in order to continue on their journey. So my first point is, when the Lord asks something of us, we must be confident that he's already prepared the way. In John chapter 6, verses 17 to 18, it says, But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, They got into the boat and headed across the lake towards Capernaum. Soon a gale swept upon them, and the sea grew very rough. 
The NASB translation says, and after getting into a boat, they started to cross to the Sea of Capernaum, to the Sea of Capernaum, to the Sea, to Capernaum, sorry, and it had uh, already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to get stirred up, be stirred up, and a strong wind was blowing. And in Matthew chapter 14, verse 24, it says that the disciples were in trouble, and they were far away from land, and Jesus wasn't there. Jesus was away. Remember, he went away to pray. So Jesus wasn't with them. In Mark chapter 6, verse 48, it says that Jesus saw that the disciples were in trouble, and they were struggling against the wind and waves. Keep that in mind. Verse 19 says, They had rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified. Now, there was no doubt that the disciples saw Jesus walking on water because then they would have no reason to be terrified. <laughs> if you saw someone, because, well, if you saw someone walking on water toward you, I think we would all be a bit like, what is happening? We'd be a little shook. But if they recognized that it was Jesus, they would have responded differently. Sometimes we don't recognize God at work in the middle of our storm. We tend to let the circumstances of life alter God at work or seeing God at work in the storm. Because they didn't believe it was Jesus. They thought it was a ghost. <laughs> God is always present in our storm. Deuteronomy uh, 31.8 says, Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither lead, never fail you nor abandon you. Amen. Continuing to verse 20, it says, But he called out to them, Don't be afraid, I am here. The words, don't be afraid, I am here, indicates that fear was banished in the presence of Jesus. When Jesus says, don't be afraid, I am here, we must focus on him and not the storm. Because the storm didn't stop. <laughs> because Jesus was walking on water. The storm didn't stop because they saw Jesus walking on water. They were still in the storm. And Jesus was fully able to calm the storms, one of the miracles he did do. <laughs> Jesus, is, Jesus gave his disciples the assurance that they weren't alone. In Mark chapter 6, verse 48, it says that Jesus saw that the disciples were in trouble and struggling against the wind and waves. Sometimes we need to be reminded that Jesus sees us in the storm. Though they might be in a storm, they're not alone. Though we might be in a storm, we're not alone. The disciples got into the boat late that evening, and they were in the middle of the lake. Remember, and Jesus was away praying, kind of recapping. And when Jesus came to them walking on water, it was 3 a.m., and some translation of, this was also mentioned in Matthew, uh, Matthew 14, verse 25, it says, in the fourth watch, which means between 3 a.m. And, and 6 a.m. Remember, when they got there, it was evening. Jesus waited to get to them, to come to them walking on water, which means that sometimes Jesus waits for, for to come to us in our storm. Sometimes we may think that God isn't coming to our rescue. God isn't answering our prayers. But God's silence is really teaching us endurance and what it means to trust in God. Walking on the sea demonstrated Jesus' power over the sea and served as a sign of Jesus' Jesus's deity. My point number three is we must believe that Jesus is the ruler over all and believe that nothing is impossible for him. Verse, uh, uh, John chapter 6, verse 21 says that they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived to their destination. The disciples were eager to let him into the boat, and they immediately arrived at their destination. When Jesus climbed into the boat, the wind stopped, and they were amazed. When we allow God into our boat, we can be confident that we will see an end to our storm. And my fourth point is when we surrender our circumstances to God, who has power over the sea, 
we can be confident that he'll get us through the storm. Amen. Verses 22, 22 through 25 says, The next day the crowd had, that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the only boat, and they realized Jesus had not gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? When the people saw this, they were baffled at how Jesus had reached to the other side and they were just merely thinking as humans, right? <laughs> They're like, whoa, what's, what's been happening? Like, we've been trying to follow you. Uh, we see you performing all these miraculous signs. But they didn't seek him because of who he was. They were after what they marveled, what they saw. They didn't see the token of his divine power and mission. So what can we learn from this passage of Scripture? Number one is when the Lord asks something of us, we must be confident that he's already prepared the way. We must not only believe that God is at work in the storm, but we must recognize God at work in the storm. We must believe that Jesus is the ruler over all and believe that nothing is impossible for him. When we surrender our circumstances to our God who has power over the sea, we can be confident that he'll get us through the storm. Throughout John's gospel, people encountered Jesus and they misunderstood him. They really didn't understand who he was. They didn't know his true identity. And when they, per when they perceived what he really was saying, some wanted to arrest him or some wanted to follow him. Only later when Jesus' disciples had received the Holy Spirit did they understand fully his significance. Only the transforming power of God's spirit can provide that understanding and help people see as children of God. So how many times does God have to remind you, don't be afraid, I am here? Are your eyes so fixed on Jesus walking on water <laughs> that you aren't even affected by the storm you're in? Jesus' miraculous signs themselves was not Jesus' purpose. Instead, they were kind of like road signs. They were messages for a bigger picture, teaching a bigger lesson. So what is God using as a sign to get your attention? We must place close attention to where God is at work in our lives and remember that he is faithful to complete the work that he started in us. We must have faith that Jesus is who he says he is. Like we saying, he is a man of his word. Faith constitutes a commitment to let his call change the way we live. Faith is the work God wants for us. So I'll ask you and I'll leave you with this question. How many times does God have to tell you, don't be afraid, I am here?